Well, welcome again to Cross Community Church. I am so excited to be in this series where we're walking through Paul's letter to the church at Philippi. Now, if you don't know uh, me, my name is Jason Waymar. I'm the lead pastor here at Cross Community, one of the elders. And a uh, little fact about myself, I am now a man. I turned 40 just a couple of weeks ago, so uh, Mike Gundy would now uh, approve of me. And one of the questions people have asked me, is you, and they ask you this more and more as you get older, they're like, does it feel any different? What's it feel like to be 40? And, I, I, of course, nothing happened overnight. Uh, but there is this thing that happens more and more in my life. Uh, and that's that I develop these pains in, in various places. And I have no idea where they came from. Uh, uh, just a couple of nights ago, I'm sitting in my recliner and my back is really sore. And I'm thinking, what is this from? Like, what have I done that I'm sore, kind of my back and my core, like, Okay, what is it that's caused it this time? This didn't happen when I was younger. I, I'm just wondering, like, what is it that's caused me to be so sore? And as I thought back, I, I'm thinking, like, what are my activities? What are the things I've done? Have I lifted something heavy, done something unique? And I could come up with nothing except a couple weeks ago, we got a little bitty bottle cap. And I, for a couple of weeks now, I've been getting up in the mornings and I go outside and this thing is so short that I have to bend over a certain way to feed this cap the bottle. And I'm stressing my body, y'all, my back, my core, to hold that bottle in that special place. I find myself really, really sore and thinking, how in the world could this have possibly caused me this much pain to just bend over ever so slightly to feed a cap a bottle? Y'all, that's, that's where I am in life. Uh, feeding a bottle now makes me sore. Now, I, I say that in jest. Uh, it's, it's, it's kind of a silly example. But for many of us, if you're alive today, you live in our nation in particular, it's likely that you're feeling some pain. If you've read much of the news or you pay attention to the, the television or you look online, watch the videos and stuff, you know that this is a difficult time for our nation. The word that I've heard over and over and over for about a year now is the term unprecedented. Everything that happens is now unprecedented, and some of that's to make you read an article or click a headline, uh, but some of it is true. Like we're in an unusual time. Uh, there's all sorts of division and difficulty for us. We see uh, political divisions. Now, uh, normally when you have massive voter turnout in an election, it's because there's one candidate who's really bad that no one's going to vote for, and so they're going to switch sides and vote for the other because the other candidate's really good. But in our country this time, we had massive voter turnout, and the margins of victory, whichever way they fell, we're razor thin. People are really motivated, but they're also really divided. We're divided on issues of race and gender and justice and equality. And, and specifically, how are we going to pursue those things in the correct way? And everyone has their opinion about how we should do this or go about that. How do we fix the brokenness of our culture? We're divided on the proper response to a virus. That has plagued our nation. Uh, many of you have suffered losses personally, people that you've known. You've been very ill yourselves, or maybe you've lost people uh, that were close to you. And if you look online, what you're not seeing for you in the midst of suffering or difficulty is compassion. But instead, you're going to read things online. I, I just picked out a couple this week. Um, if you don't wear a mask, you don't love people. If you don't wear a mask, you don't love your grandmother. If you don't wear a mask, you are selfish. If you do wear a mask, you don't care about freedom. If you do wear a mask, you don't care about the future of our country. If you do wear a mask, you're one of those sheep. Responses coming from both sides. So for us as believers in this painful I'll use the word unprecedented time in our country. It's kind of hard sometimes to make our way through. Like, how are we to think about this time? And in particular, how are we to be the people of God in a culture that seems so divided, so much difficulty here? As the people of God, I believe there's a proper response. I think that Paul exemplifies that for us in Philippians chapter 1, beginning in verse 11. If you have your Bibles, go ahead and turn with me there. Or in verse 12. 
Paul says this. Apparently, um, the Philippians had been concerned about Paul, and he's writing to reassure them about his circumstances. In verse 12, he says, Now I want you to know, brethren, that my circumstances have turned out for the greater progress of the gospel. Now, I didn't tell you a whole lot about this last week, but Paul is writing the letter to the church at Philippi from a Roman prison. Now, there are debates about the nature of his imprisonment. Was he in house arrest? Was he uh, held captive in some sort of prison or dungeon? We, we aren't told specifically, uh, but what's likely is that Paul was spending his days chained to a Roman soldier. As he writes this letter, he would have done so while in chains. When he says to them, hey, I, I want to let you guys know about how I'm doing. My circumstances have turned out for the greater progress of the gospel. His circumstances are not fun. Matter of fact, they're painful. Like Paul has suffered the loss of his freedom. The Romans were not particularly hospitable to people that, that, that were political prisoners or prisoners for any sort of reason. They weren't like, hey, let's make you comfortable in your life really good, Paul. He was in chains. He didn't have his own freedom. He wasn't able to do what God in some senses had called him to do, which was to travel and preach the gospel. Rather than doing the thing that it appeared God had called him to do, Paul finds himself confined to a prison in the city of Rome. He's chained to a Roman soldier. And yet, he writes to the Philippian believers with a great deal of joy, unusual joy in this letter. And he writes to him to report that his circumstances have turned out for the greater progress of the gospel. Here's the thing. When there is purpose in your pain, you can find joy there, right? It's kind of like uh, I told you about being 40 and these random pains that I have in my body and thinking, where in the world did that come from and not particularly enjoying it? But many of you, you might have started this year, you started your new workout regimen. You know, you got back on the treadmill, started riding the bike, you joined the gym again. And the first few days of going back to the gym, it's painful, right? Like nobody wants to be sore all over, like legs aching back, hey, all this stuff. Nobody would want that. But there's a purpose in that pain, isn't there? As a matter of fact, after you've been working out for a while and maybe your body doesn't get quite as sore anymore, you might be, uh, might be encouraged to, to work out even harder, that you might feel it because you know that that soreness means you're making progress uh, in your working out and kind of uh, building your body up and being strengthened together. I believe Paul had found purpose in his pain, and as a result, he's able to exhibit joy in writing to the Philippians, this unusual joy, even though he's in prison in Rome, even though he's spending every day chained to a Roman soldier, there's no freedom for him there. He wouldn't have had great food to eat or great care. There were people who would provide for his needs, but it was the best that they could do. And yet Paul writes with joy, hey, I need to let you guys know that my circumstances have turned out for the greater progress of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Could you say that's true of you? Is that the perspective that you have on your particular set of circumstances right now? Now, maybe this is a season of prosperity. Man, life is good. You've avoided the, the Rona in your life. Like everything seems to be going well, making extra money. You got a stimulus check. Life is good for you. Could you say that your circumstances have turned out for the greater progress of the gospel? Or maybe for you, if this season hasn't been one of prosperity. Matter of fact, you've been home a lot, and this has been a season of pain. And depression or isolation. Maybe you have been sick. Maybe you have lost a loved one. Have your circumstances turned out for the greater progress of the gospel? Here's what Paul would write to the church at Rome, Romans 8:28. We cling to this. He says that now we know that in all things, like all the things that are going on in our lives, in our day-to-day, -day, the big things and the little things, that God is working all those things together for the good of those who love God and who are called according to His purposes. When your life is given to God's purpose, you can have joy in the midst of your pain. 
It provides meaning. It provides understanding. And we can have hope even in our difficult days, even in the midst of a country where everything seems to be going astray, where you might be fearful about what's coming. Like you're, you're seeing maybe your way of life is, is threatened. Our government, our, our, the way that we've lived as Americans, it may be threatened. Maybe you're fearful for the loss of freedoms. Could you say that your perspective is that, hey, I'm confident these things, these circumstances are going to turn out for the greater progress of the gospel? Here, let me tell you some good news. The gospel of Jesus Christ thrives in the soil of adversity. Like the tougher things seem to get, the more the gospel seems to blossom. Look, look what Paul says here. In verse 13, we'll go back to 12. My circumstances have turned out for the greater progress of the gospel so that, like, look, here's what's happened, y'all. In my imprisonment in the cause of Christ, it has become well known throughout the whole Praetorian Guard and to everyone else. He's like, the cause of Christ. In my imprisonment, the cause of Christ has been made known throughout the Praetorian Guard and to everyone else. He's like, y'all, you may not have understood what was happening here. I didn't know what was happening when I came here. But guess what? I'm chained to a Roman soldier every day. And these weren't just any Roman soldiers. This was the Praetorian Guard. This word in the Greek means the palace Guard. Now, some people would say this tells us not only who Paul would be chained to, but where. This same word, praetorian, was used for the governor of Caesarea. That was his palace. That's where he lived. It was, it was used for the rulers in Jerusalem. And it's possible that Paul finds himself somewhere on the premises of the governor's palace, perhaps even rubbing shoulders with Caesar. Now, that would be a little bit speculative. I'm not sure that Paul would have seen Caesar at this point, you know, walking past him in the hallway every day. But what we know is that Caesar's guard, the royal palace guard, if you would, those are the guys who are spending a lot of time with Paul. One of the downsides of being chained to Paul every day, you might feel like you were guarding him and depriving him of freedom. But the guards weren't free either. They were a bit of a captive audience. Look what Paul says. He says, the cause of Christ has become well known. Like these guys who have been with me all this time, the guards that are rotating in and out, the people that would bring the food, the, everyone who works throughout this whole place where I am, the cause of Christ has become well known to them, to the guards and to everyone else. Now, again, Paul may not have been in the ruler's palace, but these guards would have been. And what's happened as a result of Paul's imprisonment, I told you that the gospel thrives in the soil of adversity. In the midst of his imprisonment, Paul has been able to share the gospel with people who would have walked at the highest levels of society. The praetorian guard would have, would have been the guys who would have walked and guarded and cared for the dignitaries, the rulers, the important people in the city of Rome. And Paul's like, the gospel's going out to these people. Man, I can rejoice, I can write to you, even though my circumstances would give me no joy. Even though my circumstances are dire, I'm in chains here, I have joy because it's turned out for the greater progress of the gospel. Because the gospel thrives in the soil of adversity. But the gospel didn't just go to the palace, it went even beyond. Continue reading here. He says, and that most of the brethren, trusting in the Lord... Because of my imprisonment, most of the brothers trusting the Lord because of my imprisonment have far more courage to speak the word of God without fear. Now, here's the thing. Paul got arrested for preaching the gospel. So the scribes, the Pharisees, the Roman cohort who might have gone to arrest Paul, um, they were thinking, this guy's stirring up trouble for us going into the synagogues and preaching. So we're going to put him in prison and that will fix it. That didn't fix it, right? It just made the problem worse. Not only did Paul continue to share the gospel with some of the, the guards of the elite people in their society, all of the brethren. Now, again, you would think people get put in prison for preaching the gospel. You would think, I, I'm not going to preach the gospel because I don't want to go to prison. But God used his circumstances because of my imprisonment, he said. The brethren have far more courage. To speak the word of God without fear. Now the inference here is that prior to Paul going to prison, preaching the gospel there, 
the believers in the city of Rome and wherever they might have been were fearful to share the gospel. It's likely that they were a little bit like you and me. They knew the goodness of the gospel. They were so thankful for the work of Jesus Christ that he'd done on their behalf, that they were dead in trespasses and sins and they'd been made alive together with Christ. But sharing the gospel, they were fearful. And I don't want to alienate my friends. I'm not sure if I have the right words. All of the things you would have felt, they would have felt. And yet because Paul is now in prison for sharing the gospel, as they were encouraged, they had much more courage to share the gospel without fear. I told you the gospel grows. It thrives in the soil of adversity. Their circumstances. And imagine if one of us got arrested and put in jail for the cause of Christ. Imagine if you lost not just some of your freedoms... You lost all of your freedom to come and go as you wish, to see your family. It would be hard to count that as joy. It would be hard to see that as something to celebrate. Unless you understood that there's a purpose in that pain. And yet the people of God, Paul and the believers, much more encouraged to share Sometimes it's the difficulty of our circumstances that gives us proper perspective in this world. Sometimes it's what we suffer, the things we endure, it's the pain we feel that helps us fall back on our actual purpose, the reason that we have been put here on this earth. Paul says we know that in in all things, God is working all things together for good for those who love God who have been called according to his purpose. Is it true for you that in your circumstance, whatever you're going through today, and you're out there pursuing the gospel, you're out there pursuing the kingdom of God, taking the gospel into your circumstance, seeing that God has worked this ultimately for your good and for his glory. Pain with purpose can look like progress. It can encourage us. Believer in Jesus who might be here today, I want to encourage you that what we're going through as a nation and what you may be going through as an individual, it's not a random thing. It's not something that's happening outside of the sovereignty of God. As a matter of fact, every detail of every circumstance in every place at every moment, God is sovereign over those details, and he is working his work in and through us. Will we, as believers in Jesus Christ, step into our purpose? You see, what Paul could have done is got bogged down in the circumstances, become paralyzed by his pain. He could have let the threats, he'd been beaten before. He'd endured great loss. He could have allowed that to to drive him within, to focus on his own suffering, to to alienate his purpose. He's like, no, no, no. In my circumstance right now, it means greater progress for the gospel of Jesus Christ. Several years ago, I was gifted, my wife and I were gifted a trip to Rome. And we got to see all the cool stuff in the city. We walked like miles and miles and miles every day. The Colosseum, the Vatican, it was just unbelievable. And as I came back and I was telling the story to people about what we saw, the thing that may have stuck out to me the most wasn't the Colosseum, and it wasn't St. Peter's Basilica or the Vatican. It was the catacombs. If you don't know what they are, the catacombs are an intricate network of tunnels that um, are just outside the, the walls of the city. And the catacombs are actually, they were burial sites. So you would have these tunnels with little um, indentations that have been cut out in the walls where they would place their dead. And the reason the catacombs started to be used is because Christians started to exist in the city of Rome. In Rome, the, the pagan practice was to burn the bodies of their dead. 
the Christians, they wanted to have like a, a Christian type ceremony and burial. But it wasn't legal to be a Christian in Rome, and so they had to find a place where they could have these funeral type services and where they could bury their dead instead of burning them. So they would go outside the walls of the city. They dug these intricate tunnels. They would bury their dead there. They would have a service for them. And for a couple of hundred years there, um, a little bit after the time of Paul, Christians began to do this. What is remarkable is that if you went to Rome today and you could tour the catacombs, you would find over 60 different sets of tunnels of 60 different catacombs, hundreds and hundreds of miles of tunnels, hundreds of thousands of believers who existed in Rome because Paul dared to see the purpose in his pain. He dared to speak the gospel into his circumstances, which for most of us would have seemed hopeless. For most of us, we might have been disheartened. For most of us, we might have been I don't know, tempted to give up and to quit. And yet Paul preached the gospel. The brethren were encouraged all the more to speak the word of God. And in that city, the gospel began to spread and the gospel began to grow such that in the city of Rome, where Paul finds himself in prison for preaching the gospel, just a few years later, in 313, the Edict of Milan made Christianity a legal religion in the Roman Empire. In 380, the Edict of Thessalonica made Christianity the religion of the Roman Empire. If you know about the, the church, like Rome became the center of Christianity, if you will. And it began with Paul, who found himself in chains. And didn't see those chains as a threat or an obstacle and instead saw his circumstances as an opportunity for progress. For us as the church of Jesus Christ today, like it might be important or it might be something we need to do that we take the time to step back and kind of pull off the lenses of culture that we have. And we begin to examine ourselves and our perspective that we have for what we're going through currently. So today I want to give you just three quick things to think through for you to consider our pain, our circumstances, our calling, and our purpose right now in the place that we find ourselves both individually and as a nation. In these circumstances, number one, I want to challenge you to consider which kingdom you're fighting for. See, we live here in flesh and blood, and we really do need physical things in this life. We have to eat. We have to drink. We need a place to sleep, right? We live in a physical world, and yet we know that this world is not our home. If you're a believer in Jesus, this world isn't your home. You're just passing through. This is your missionary journey, if you will. One day you're going to be home, and that's in a place called heaven. Right now we're in a difficult place, but it might feel kind of foreign to us. It might, you know, like you look around, and you're like, I don't even belong here. What is this world I'm living in? But to see yourself like, hey, this isn't the kingdom I'm fighting for. I'm supposed to be seeking first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, not this one. Maybe we need to be reminded that our battle here as believers is not against flesh and blood, but of powers and principalities and rulers of darkness. The battle that we fight is not against our flesh and blood. When you think about your responses right now, what we're going through as a nation, the conversations you're having with friends and coworkers, neighbors, things that you're sharing online, I want to encourage you to consider which kingdom you're fighting for. When they came to arrest Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane, Peter was there. And the belief at the time was that Jesus was going to come and he was going to establish this earthly kingdom. And he was going to rule with grace and mercy and justice. He's going to establish the nation of Israel as this, this kingdom here on this earth. And they were going to be a lighthouse to the world. That was the belief. So it only made sense when they came to arrest Jesus that Peter would pull out his sword. And he would strike Malchus, who was the servant of the high priest. And he cut off his ear. Y'all, he wasn't aiming for his ear, right? He's going to fight. He's going to fight for Jesus. He's going to fight for truth. He's going to fight physically to protect him. 
And Jesus looked at him and said, Peter, put down your sword. Peter had a calling on his life, but it wasn't against flesh and blood. It was to build his kingdom. It was to shepherd his sheep. It was to make disciples. For us, sometimes, just like Peter, we can get confused and start fighting the wrong battle on the wrong front with the wrong weapons. Today, I want to challenge you to consider which kingdom you're fighting for. For us, our battle, our hope, the thing that we do when we leave here is we go out to take light in the darkness. We show the divine love that's been shown to us. I mean, think about it. We're recipients of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Every single one of us in this room were condemned to an eternity in hell, no less. And we deserved it. Our sin, the just punishment for our sin, was death. Eternity separated from God in a place of torment. That's what we deserved. But you know what God gave to us? Grace. Mercy. Forgiveness. Love. He looked at us in all of our sin, and he knew it all, right? The good, the bad, and the ugly. The thing that you're ashamed of, God knew it. And he chose to lavish his grace upon you. And then he sent us out in the world. He told us to go make more disciples. And how hypocritical is it when we see people that might have sinned against us, might not believe the way we do, have the perspectives that we have, Pull out our sword and think, you deserve this. We've been extended grace that we don't deserve. Love that we could never merit. But God has lavished that on us. May we be the people of love fighting for the kingdom of God and not the kingdom of this world. Number two. Put down your sword and take up the gospel. Maybe you're like the people in the story that where, where Paul talks about the brethren. It says they have far more courage to speak the word of God without fear. Maybe you're like them in that you've been fearful. Man, you've got friends, you've got loved ones, you've got neighbors, you've got coworkers that you know they don't know Jesus Christ. You know that they're headed toward an eternity separated from him. And up until this moment, you've, you've just been fearful. What are they going to think? What are they going to say? What if I lose the relationship? Today, I want to encourage you to put down your earthly sword where you might battle against differing perspectives and ideologies. Instead, you take up the gospel of Jesus Christ. If you want to change someone's mind, you can start with their heart. When Jesus Christ comes in, the way, the truth, and the life, the rest of it's all taken care of, right? If they know Jesus and they surrender to following him, if you're convinced you're following after Jesus and you convince them to do the same, you're on the same path. And so we put down our swords and we take up the gospel. There's this interesting thing that happened uh, in the city of Rome. He says, most of the brethren, trusting in the Lord because of my imprisonment, they have far more courage to speak the word of God without fear. And so what has happened was Paul's boldness, his courage, like encouraged other people. And more and more people start sharing the gospel. Like we see that the gospel spread throughout Rome. Hundreds of thousands of believers out of that city alone in just a couple of hundred years after Paul was there. It got so big. It, it, this is kind of odd. You're not going to see this anywhere else in the Bible as far as I know. He says, some to be sure are preaching Christ from envy and strife. Anybody else out there? Like you go out to, in, in, in your place of business, you're like, you know, I, this other person, they're leading some people to Jesus. I'm, I'm going to step up my game. I'm, I, I'm envious. I want to do it. Others for uh, reasons of strife. It goes on. It says, some also from goodwill, the latter do it out of love, knowing that I'm appointed for the defense of the gospel. The former proclaim Christ out of selfish ambition. Anybody out there sharing the gospel out of selfish ambition? I don't know what happened in that city, but the boldness of Paul encouraged many other people to declare the gospel with boldness, some people even doing so out of wrong motives. Man, I want to live in a city like this. 
or, or some people are doing it the right way, as they should, right? But even the people who aren't sharing the gospel with the right motives, they're out there sharing it. It might have been selfish motives. It might have been out of envy, but they're doing it. And Paul says in verse 18, what then? Good reasons, bad reasons, right motives, wrong motives, what then? Only that in every way, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is proclaimed, and in this I will rejoice. Do you consider which kingdom you're fighting for? I encourage you to put down your sword and take up the gospel of Jesus Christ. God has placed you, God who is perfect in all of his ways, who knows your strengths and your weaknesses, the good, the bad, and the ugly about you, has seen fit to place you in your particular set of circumstances to take the gospel there. There's somebody who's just waiting to be encouraged by your own courage. There's somebody who needs to hear you witnessing for the Lord Jesus Christ or making disciples there, to just talking about what God has done in your own heart, that they might be encouraged to do the same. So put down your sword. It's the wrong battle. It's the wrong weapon. And take up the gospel. The final thing here is be encouraged that others, be courageous that others may be encouraged. As I said, there's somebody waiting. Somebody whose heart's still full of fear. Somebody who's too timid, who thinks they don't know enough, that's just waiting to see you, waiting to hear you, to see you lead by example that they might share too. It's this domino effect. Person after person being encouraged because someone would first be courageous. The thing that I've challenged our church to do, we've been talking about this for three weeks now, is that every one of us here, would lead one person to Christ by the end of this year. Now, I hope it's a dozen, but at least one person to Christ. In the next few minutes, can I just encourage you to pray like you've never prayed before? Can I encourage you to dream like you've never dreamed before, like to think about your family, if the gospel just swept through that uncle that always causes the problems, or, or that person in your workplace, what if they got saved? And what if the next person did too? And what if more people were emboldened to share the gospel? In, through cross-community church, one person goes out, and then it begins to ripple outward. More and more people emboldened to share. I wonder if we could have a story written about us a couple of hundred years from now, that the city of Hodo was markedly different because somebody had the courage to find purpose in their pain. To not get discouraged by what they were going through by their circumstance, but instead to say, hey, I'm going to bring Christ into this circumstance. I'm going to surrender my life. I'm going to seek first the kingdom of God, whether I'm in chains or I'm on a cruise. Whether I mean, it doesn't matter what I'm going through. I'm going to bring the gospel there. We are the church of Jesus Christ. We're the one that Jesus left the 99 to come and find. And now we've been commissioned to go out and make disciples of others, baptizing them, teaching them to obey everything Jesus has commanded. So I dare you to find purpose in your pain, to leverage your life for the sake of the gospel. And see what God can do in our city, in our community, our county, and in your family. Can I pray for you? Lord Jesus, I pray that we would not be Christians who sit on the sidelines. Lord, may we see from the example of Paul where today we're recipients. We're beneficiaries of his work beneficiaries of those early believers who encouraged, who were encouraged to speak the gospel with boldness. Lord, we've lived in a country that has been shaped in many ways by the gospel. Yeah, it's not going well right now. We acknowledge that. It's not pretty, but we realize that in the midst of this difficulty, these circumstances, God, that you have called us to bear witness to Christ, that we might get to be the next generation that leads to the flourishing of a culture because they've surrendered their lives to you. God, use us as your people. Don't let us be comfortable. But instead, Father, I pray that we would live out our calling here. We would find purpose in this moment, in our pain. We would live lives that honor and glorify you. Father, I pray that we may be a people who speak the gospel with courage, 
and without fear. I pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen.